Okay, this is my first screencast ever. I'm not sure how it's going to work. Um, I've been working on this for a while today and already realized I don't like the program I downloaded, but this is the one I'm working with. So this is the Anatomy Chapter 10 test review. Um, second hour's anatomy class will have presenters in, so they're not going to have a formal review in class tomorrow. So I wanted to try to give you the review anyways, so we're going to do it this way on the podcast, or screencast, you know what I mean. Okay, so going over your review sheet, the first question had to do with the eight components of blood, and a lot of students were stuck. They wanted there to only be four because they were thinking red cells, white cells, platelets, and plasma, but I was considering all the white blood cells together, so that made five blood cells, plus the plasma red blood cells and platelets. So that's how you get eight. And then you wanted to know their functions and descriptions, like we want to know about everything else. So plasma, typically um, straw-colored, it's the only liquid portion of blood, makes up about 55% of the blood. It carries nutrients, waste, um, that's its main function is, is a mode of transport and a solvent. Um, red blood cells or erythrocytes, we are pretty familiar with the characteristics, biconcaved, anucleate, which means it doesn't have a nucleus, it can't uh, reproduce through mitosis, no mitochondria, which means it's not going to use the oxygen it carries, which makes it quite um, efficient. And then its basic job is to transport oxygen. The majority of your oxygen is transported connected to the hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cells. And then you have your platelets or thrombocytes. These are not even cells. They're fragments of a cell. So a megakaryocyte gets really big and little pieces start to pop off of it. And then those are used to um, start the clotting cascade. And then you have your different white blood cells listed there, the fills and the sites. And we're going to talk about those on another slide. So I'm going to wait on those. Okay, I picked this graphic because it includes the different types of cells as well as um, what they do. So you have your centrifuge tube over on the left, and you can see um, the plasma at the top there, the yellowish portion, more than half, so 55%. The red portion at the bottom, those are your erythrocytes, and um, that's 45% of your blood. And then the buffy coat really isn't shown here. The buffy coat is made up of the white blood cells and the platelets, and that's less than 1%. And you guys already have done like a pie graph of that, so I am not putting the percentages on the test, but I would expect that you know the majority of your um, blood is plasma, and then the majority of the plasma is water. So you can see on the table what the plasma is made up of, and I'm going to jump over to the plasma proteins on the chart. Um, we talked about albumin, which is for osmotic pressure. We talked about fibrinogen, that's the protein needed for blood clotting. And then you have your immunoglobulins, and maybe that sounds funny, but those are your antibodies. Uh, so that's going to be used to fight infections. Um, and then going down to our red cells, we already talked their basic job is to transport oxygen. Um, and then the leukocytes, again, we have another slide that's going to talk about each of those individually, so I'm going to wait on that one. Okay, I know you're getting anxious to talk about white blood cells. So we have the granulocytes and the agranulocytes. Uh, this slide is talking about the granulocytes, so those that are filled with granules, so their name is. Um, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, remember the ending fill is a helpful hint that those are filled with granules. So again, you want to know their descriptions and their functions, and we talked about these and had a quiz on them, so most of us are pretty well set with that. Um, the neutrophil, I like to remember the word neutra or the prefix maybe. Neutra is numerous, so they're the most numerous white blood cells. They're also um, a numerous lobed. So down at the bottom, the picture on the furthest left, that would be a neutrophil. Those are phagocytes, meaning that they eat other cells or particles in circulation, which means in the blood. So um, neutrophils typically are going to increase in number when you have an acute, like a sudden onset infection, um, and they're going to help that go away. Eosinophils, remember sin, pin, pin is a type of worm, so they affect parasitic worms or multicellular parasites. They are the second uh, picture on the, in the graph at the bottom there. And they have a bilobed nucleus, 
meaning um, it has two parts to it, and that's the one that looks kind of like earmuffs or headphones. Um, and then the basophil, the one in the middle at the bottom, they you typically under a microscope can't even see the nucleus because the granules are so large. Um, so coarse granules, they also are bilobed, but like I said, you don't really see it. it typically is a figure eight nucleus. Um, these are your, your least numerous, not so many, but they're filled with histamine, which is pretty important because that's an uh, di vasodilator, so that's going to play a big role in allergies, and that's why we take an antihistamine. So talking about the agranulocytes, those white blood cells that don't have a granule, uh, remember the ending for these are going to be site, as in cells, so you have monocyte, lymphocyte, um, and then you have a, a picture. I was going to try to do a graphic. No, I'm not very good. Um, <laughs> anyways, you have the graph over there on the right-hand side. It's a table, not a graph. But anyways, you can see it identifies each, the neutrophil, the basophil, the eosinophil, um, the different lymphocytes, and then the macrophage, um, and it says what they do. So the monocyte, that is the one at the bottom there, that is the largest of your white blood cells. Their nucleus is kidney-shaped, and it takes up a good amount of the cell. So they're going to form macrophages and tissue. So remember, macrophage is big eater, and we're going to use that term again in the next chapter. And then um, notice that's tissues rather than in circulation. So that's one of the differences between neutrophils and uh, monocytes. And then the lymphocytes, those are your smallest of the white blood cells. And then notice their nucleus takes up almost the entire cell. That's the middle one. Um, and it's just a circular nucleus. So you want to remember that lymphocytes come in two forms, three, but we're really only talking about two right now, the B cell, the T cell, and then next chapter we'll talk about the natural killer cells. So the B cells are the ones that form antibodies, and the T cells will infect, um, they'll destroy infected tissues, ones that are infected with viruses and cancer. And again, we'll talk more about that next chapter. For this chapter, just know that there's two types of lymphocytes and that the B cells make the antibodies. Okay, I already talked a little bit about the red blood cells. Not a whole lot new information here. Because they don't have a nucleus, they don't reproduce, they do have a lifespan. And that's typically 120 days. Of course, it can vary, but the number we're going to remember is 120. And then um, the no nucleus means that they can carry ox or I'm sorry, the no mitochondria portion means that they can carry oxygen without using it for cellular respiration. So they're not using up the oxygen that they carry. Um, the pictures at the bottom, those are miscellaneous trivia. Every minute, 300 million cells um, in your body die. And of course, on the left there, your body produces 300 million. You don't need to know that. Just interesting to trivia. Talking about platelets or thrombocytes, remember the precursor that creates platelets is megakaryocyte. A lot of people during the review were wanting to write down um, the myeloid stem cell, and that's not what the question is asking. Yes, the myeloid differentiates into a megakaryocyte, but the megakaryocyte is actually the cell that is creating the thrombocyte. So that's what is considered the precursor. It comes before the thrombocyte. So um, this right here, that is a megakaryocyte, and then you can see it's fragmenting all these little dudes, and those are your thrombocytes. Um, so put an ending on the word and you're either building the numbers or decreasing the numbers. So thrombocytopenia, remember penia is a decrease in numbers, so it's a low platelet count. And um, <clears throat> that might d be due to like chemicals that in a medicine that you're taking or, or radiation or something. Uh, thrombocytosis, that ending osis is a abnormal condition, and in this case is an abnormally high condition. So it's an elevated platelet count. And the picture that I have here, um, the picture on the left is a normal platelet count here. And so the little purple dudes, that's what is your platelet. And then the picture on the right is your low count. So that's thrombocytopenia. So you'll see those words and really all you have to know is their definition. So some basic characteristics of blood. Um, 
typically it's thicker than water and mo more viscous means that it's basically that's what it means it's thicker it doesn't move as fluid it's it's more like a gel um, I think that description of viscous is a little exaggeration because plasma is not like a gel um, but it's a little bit thicker than water it flows more slowly than water its temperature is a little hotter than our body core because as as you get away from the source and the source being the blood um, it's going to decrease in temperature so it's going to dissipate as it as it leaves the vessel so your body core is actually a, a lower temperature than your blood the pH of blood you could generalize it it's about 7.4 it can range 7.35 7.45 when we talk about the respiratory system, we'll talk about how that pH is actually going to um, affect our breathing rate. And then it's about 8% of your total body weight. So of course, different size people are going to have different volumes of blood. And then we're going to learn the average male. Um, so five to six liters is the average male's volume. Uh, females are typically lower, but... Um, but we're ju just know the five to six for the test, okay? And um, that's about it for that slide. Relating red blood cells to oxygen transport. Um, first of all, I'm going to do the hemoglobin. And down there at the right-hand side, that was supposed to be a hemoglobin molecule, though I don't think that it showed up very good. It has four different protein um, chains that are clumped together and then each one of them there's like a white circle in the middle there and originally that was a red circle those are your hem hem hemigroups um, iron is found there and then the iron binds oxygen so you can see there are four hemigroups which means they can born f they can bond four molecules of oxygen and each red cell carries 250 million hemoglobin molecules, so that's like a billion oxygen molecules. Pay attention to the question on the test. Is it asking for how many oxygen can the cell carry or how many oxygens can the hemoglobin carry? Um, so the next thing is the large surface area. That was a stumper when students were filling this out in the in the class. The surface area, what that does is it increases the efficiency of the cell uh, t so that diffusion of gases occurs more quickly. So, um, and more can diffuse at one time. So this picture over here, you have an alveolus, which is an air sac in your lungs, and CO2 is diffusing into the alveolus while oxygen is diffusing across it. And so by having a large surface area, you're able to come in contact, first of all, with that alveolus much more quickly. And also it, it kind of stretches your membrane. And so it's a little bit thinner, which makes it easier for molecules to go across the membrane. Platelets are in charge of hemostasis, not homeostasis. Students mispronounce this a lot. So hemostasis is basically blood clotting. You get a cut and it's got to make a scab and that's hemostasis. So um, hemostasis, blood standing still, is what the word translates into and it's going to stop bleeding, whether that's inside or outside. But when blood vessels break, collagen is exposed and that's going to trigger the whole thing. So collagen is sticky. Remember, proteins are sticky. So collagen is going to cause platelets to stick to it and that's going to start the whole entire cascade of events. So a lot of people had trouble identifying collagen in the um, class review. They wanted to say thromboplastin, which is an understandable um, answer, but, but that's what it's, it's looking for is the collagen was exposed and that's the first trigger. So the three basic descriptions or phases of hemostasis, and we'll talk about um, them on another slide, is vasoconstriction. Vaso is vessel. Constriction gets smaller. Um, platelet plug, so platelet referring to the actual platelets, and then coagulation, and then that's going to refer to the blood cells themselves. Okay, so here are the phases. I liked this graphic because it kind of showed you what was happening as well as described it. So step one, you have your vascular spasm. So the blood vessel is spasming, um, but that's going to cause the vasoconstriction, and that's due to the serotonin that the um, trapped 
platelets are going to produce. And then after that, we're going to start to attract more platelets. This is kind of happening at the same time. So serotonin's released, thromboplastin is released, ADP is released, and then that's going to attract other platelets to the area. It's almost like I don't know if it's a call for help or it's like calling in the army or what, but more cells are going to come to the area or more platelets are going to come to the area and they're going to get trapped there as well and then they're going to start to release more chemicals which are going to attract more platelets and then they're going to get trapped and you can see it's a positive feedback loop there. And then the final step is um, going to be coagulation. So the platelets are going to cause a chemical reaction to occur um, with thromboplastin and prothrombin and blah, blah, blah. I believe this is on another slide, so I'm abbreviating right now. Um, but ultimately, it's going to create the protein fibers fibrin, and then that is what your body will use kind of like its own gauze, like natural gauze. So it makes a mesh net. The net will capture red blood cells as they try to leave the leaky vessel. And that's the coagulation is the red cells being clumped together. So here's the description. I just kind of went over vasoconstriction and platelets. So that first phase, vasoconstriction, blood vessels constrict. They get smaller. When they get smaller, they're going to um, squeeze those platelets, which causes them to degranule. Um, they're going to release their granules. The stuck platelets release serotonin. That's going to cause the vasoconstriction. That's going to do a couple things. Um, other than rupturing the platelets, it also decreases blood flow. So if I'm cut, I want to not bleed as much as possible. So, um, so the blood vessel, by getting smaller, release, reduces the amount of, of blood loss. Then... Um, the pl platelets release, there's a typo there, release thromboxane and ADP. I think I might have said thromboplastin on the last slide. Um, but they release thro thromboxane and ADP, and then that's that signal for other cells to come to the, to the area. It's called positive chemotaxis. So positive is going toward... Taxis is a movement. You can go toward or away, negative taxis. Um, but it's going toward a specific chemical, and so that's why it's chemo. Texas. Um, and that is what is going to cause the platelet plug. So that's going to be the initial um, stop, I guess, in the blood vessel. So the third phase, coagulation, blood clotting itself, is um, a set of chemical reactions. It's a cascade, so it kind of like a chain of event. And it, it begins with prothrombin interacting with thromboplastin, which is released from the surface, or it's found on the surface of the injured cells. And so the thromboplastin interacts with the prothrombin, which produces thrombin, prothrombin, thrombin, pro comes before. Um, and then the thrombin is going to um, be used to convert fibrinogen to fibrin, um, and then that fibrin, I told you, is the patch that you'll use to um, create your blood clot. So um, I'm going to try a drawing here. So here you have your prothrombin, and you can see that's turning into thrombin. And then thrombin causes the interaction between fibrinogen, um, well, not the interaction, but the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. Um, I haven't talked about prothrombin a lot in the past. I just talked about thromboplastin. And so on the test, I don't use prothrombin. I just start with thromboplastin, um, creating thrombin, which then changes fibrinogen into fibrin. So those are the four that you'll want to know for the test. So some factors that can affect blood clotting, um, what we can do externally, we can apply gauze and pressure the gauze, um, gives it gives red blood cells and platelets a surface on which to adhere, so it causes them to stick. Um, and then the pressure is kind of like that vasoconstriction, it further ruptures platelets causing that degranulation so that they'll release their thromboxane, ADP and serotonin. Um, and then hemophilia, this is kind of, it's related, but it seems maybe off topic on this slide. 
But hemophilia, you guys did a really good job remem remembering your genetics. So it's a sex-linked recessive disorder. So that means that it's going to be more common in males than it is in females. And basically, um, the people that have hemophilia are lacking a certain clotting factor or, um, or a number of clotting factors because there's like 13 of them. So that would be hemophilia, and it causes them not to be able to clot their blood um, efficiently, and sometimes they need a little help in doing so. Hematopoiesis, not one of your favorites because it has a lot of hard terms in it, um, but hematopoiesis is really just the formation of blood cells, hemoblood poiesis formation. So, um, so this is referring to how one stem cell can become any type of your red blood, or I'm sorry, any type of your blood cells. So that one, um, sorry, that one um, stem cell is called a hematocytoblast or hemocytoblast. So this one is a a multipotent or a pluripotent stem cell it can become all kinds of different cells. So it's going to differentiate into one of two kinds, which means it's specializing into one of two branches. And um, once it's in one of those branches, it's limited to the number of cells it can become. So the hematocytoblast is your original stem cell for all blood cells. And then it may become a myeloid secondary stem cell over... It looks like it's over here, actually. So the myeloid secondary stem cell stays in the bone marrow, and that's where it will differentiate into different types of cells. So it might become a red blood cell. It might become a platelet. It might become all of your different fills. Wherever they are, here they are. Um, it might become a monocyte. And then if that cell is going to differentiate in the lymph tissue... So it's called a lymphoid secondary stem cell. So the first part of the word tells you where it's at. And then um, that lymphoid might become one of your lymphocytes. So that's not too hard to remember because lymph and lymph, they go together. So you have your T cells, your um, B cells, and then your natural killer cells. Our lecture on hematopoiesis was relatively short. There's not a lot of information um, as far as the differentiation that I'm going to expect you to know. Um, the terms erythropoiesis, leukopoiesis, thrombopoiesis, the first part of the word tells you what it makes. Erythro makes erythrocytes, leuko makes leukocytes, thrombo makes thrombocytes. Um, and then you want to know what it's forming and then um, what type of hormone um, will cause it to differentiate. So erythropoiesis is the formation of red blood cells stimulated by hypoxia, hypo low oxy oxygen. So when your body senses low oxygen, the kidney releases erythropoietin, which then travels through the blood to the bone marrow and signals new red cells to form. Leukopoiesis, you got white blood cells being made all the time, whether you're sick or not. They're going to increase in number due to an infection. Um, depending on the type of infection, a signal in the form of interleukin or colony stimulating factor might be sent, and then that's going to um, stimulate the production of certain types of white blood cells. And then thrombopoiesis, um, like EPO, you have TPO, thrombopoietin, so um, platelet formation is going to be the differentiation into the megakaryocyte, and that is stimulated by the thrombopoietin. Agglutination kind of sounds like coagulation. Um, they're similar, but not identical. Coagulation, you have the red cells being trapped in a net. And then agglutination, you have red cells being stuck together and broken apart. So um, agglutination happens because of antibodies. So we are talking about this when we talk about blood cell types. So you have your A's, your type A blood, or your type B blood. And in this picture, um, it looks like I have A, those blue circles I think are A antigens. So, um, and then the little stick thing here, that's an antibody. So the antibody... Um, these are A antigens, this is an A antibody, and what you see is here the shapes don't match because it's more of a V-shaped, um, and then those are circular. So then you have the, what do I have? 
<laughs> sorry. Um, this is type A blood, and then this is a type B antibody, I think. Anyways, this one fits. Um, I can see that. So the V fits the circle, or I'm sorry, the U shape antibody fits the circle on the red blood cell. So what's going to happen is white blood cell, or I'm so sorry, antibodies are going to grab hold of, you can see it's grabbing hold of one, two different red cells at the same time. And so it's going to grab hold of a bunch of different ones and create like a mob of red blood cells. And then this is gonna cause cytolysis. Red blood cells are gonna break apart. Hemoglobin is leaked. We know hemoglobin is sticky because it's a protein. And then what you see over here is the hemoglobin, or I'm sorry, the, um, the cells are clumping together and they're breaking apart. And so you no longer have a fluid form of blood, but you have that, that splotchiness. So we've had so many different types of graphics on antigens, antibodies, um, genotypes, phenotypes. So I don't have a graphic here, um, but this is, is referring to the difference between self and non-self, and self is just those cells that belong in your body. So remember, I'm type A positive. So for me, cells with the A antigen would be identified as self, and if a B blood cell was introduced to my body, my body would read that as not belonging and consider it non-self. And so it would attack it. So you want to know the difference between the antigen and the antibody. So the antigen is the protein that's on the red blood cell. The antibody is a protein that is in the plasma, not on the cell. Um, so you have, remember, um, Landsteiner's law that you'll have the antibody for the antigen you lack. So type A blood will have type B antibodies. So I have type A blood, I'm going to have B antibodies. And then a person with type B blood would have B antigens and the opposite, A antibody. And the person with AB blood has both antigens. And because they're not lacking any antigen, they won't have any antibodies. And then type O blood doesn't have the A or the B antigen. They do have antigen, so that's not to say they don't have any proteins on their cell. They have an antigen H, which is not an antigen we have antibodies for. So in this case, they're lacking both of those important antigens, the A and the B, and therefore they will have both the antibodies, A and B. Hopefully you don't feel the need to memorize the blood donor recipient compatibility chart. It should be something that you can reason your way through, not memorize. So remember, first of all, that it is the recipient who makes the antibodies. So it's only the antibodies of the recipient, the person receiving the blood, that can cause an incompatibility match. Like they're the one that are going to cause the problem. So the donor, you're looking at the antigens that are in the red cells, not the antibodies that that person might be able to make. So... <clears throat> If you are the patient and you are receiving blood and you have type A blood to begin with, you have type B antibodies and your B antibodies will attack any blood with B antigens. So if you receive B blood or AB blood, your anti-B antibodies are going to attack that red cell. If you have type B blood as the receiver, you have A antibodies, so you can't receive any blood with A. So A or AB blood, you will attack. AB blood doesn't have any antibodies, so it doesn't matter what the, re the donor has. It doesn't matter what the donor could make. The donor isn't going to make antibodies. The recipient will. So if you're receiving and you're already AB and you have no antibodies, you could take anybody's blood and you would have no interactions. Type O, because they have A antibodies and B antibodies, they'll attack anything with A or B or AB. So they can't receive anybody's blood but O. So the key 
is remembering that the recipient, the receiver, the patient, is the one who makes the antibodies. It doesn't matter what antibodies the donor has. The recipient is the one who makes the antibodies to attack it. And you want to be able to describe the specific antibody antigen interaction. And to say the specific would be like the receiver's anti-A antibodies will attack the donor's A antigens and cause them to cytolicize. Big word. Okay, so the difference, remember, between genotype and phenotype, genotypes are the type of genes you have. The name tells you that. It's your DNA. It's your genetic code. You can't see it when you look at a person. I don't see a bunch of A's when I look at my face. Um, but your phenotype, your physical features, your photograph, you can see when you look at a person. So though you don't see type A on my face, you can see it in a lab. When you test my blood, you'll have an interaction with it. So that's the phenotype, is your blood type. Your genotype are the letters. So in this, um, in this table, if you will, over here are my genotypes, and then on the left-hand side are my phenotypes. And phenotype is like the physical characteristic, right? So what are we actually talking about? You're talking about the antigens. And check it out down here. I picked this graphic because it shows you how close these molecules are to each other. So you can see type O basically has the initial piece of antigen and then anti or then A antigens and B antigens just added a little piece of something to it. So, um, so you can see the green, blue, red, blue, yellow, yeah? That's consistent in all three blood types. And then you can see antigen A got a new little piece added to it, a new little sugar by the looks of it. And then little B has a different um, sugar added to it. So that's what makes them molecularly different, structurally different. That's the physicality of it. That's the phenotype. So you all did pretty well with Punnett squares. On the test, I'll give you um, some situation, and I'll ask you maybe if, if mom is possible or if dad is possible or what type of child would they have. So just being familiar with some terminology, I think, is important when you do Punnett squares. Heterozygous means you have one of each. You have a dominant and a recessive. It doesn't mean you have an A and a B. But you have either A or B, because they're dominant, and O, which is recessive. Um, a, B is considered co-dominant. So in this graphic, dad is A, B, and he's got two of the dominant traits. Mom is heterozygous, so she's A, O. Um, and then remember, to fill it in, you just bring those words down, these across, and it's kind of like a math table where the two come together together. That's what you have. So inside of the possible children, not the guaranteed children, but every child has, in this case, a 50% chance of being type A blood and a 25% chance of being AB and a 25% chance of being um, type B blood. So I could refer to the genotype ratio, in which case I'm referring to what the letters look like inside the box, or I can refer to the phenotype ratio, which is referring to what type of blood they have. So um, you can expect a couple Punnett squares in the test. Another antigen that is present on blood cells or not present on blood cells is the Rh factor. Remember, it's Rh because of the rhesus monkey, um, and that's where it was first identified. So people that have um, the Rh antigen, like myself, would have Rh positive blood. Um, and then if you don't have that antigen, like Mrs. Kip, you would be Rh negative. So um, if a person is exposed to Rh positive blood and they themselves are negative, the first time they're exposed, it's not a big deal. They will now make antibodies against it. So they're considered sensitized. That's the term. Um, so if they're sensitized, they've already been exposed. They've already produced those darn antibodies. And then they will attack the Rh antigen if they see it again in the future. So you can see that interaction in the bottom left there, the little blue Ys. 
those are your antibodies, and you can see that agglutination, the red cells all getting clumped together because the white cells are, are creating a mob. And then um, that's an, a problem for moms that are Rh negative if they're carrying Rh positive babies. So the Rh positive, again, mom's blood is going to be um, going across the placenta, and it's going to be mixing in with the baby's blood. So if she has antibodies in her blood, her blood will attack the newborn or the fetus's uh, blood, and you could have that hemolytic disease of the newborn. And again, um, the first time it's my understanding that it's not a big deal, but each time after that, it becomes worse and worse and worse. And um, to counter that, I'm not sure I might have that on the next slide, you would use a treatment of Rogam. Okay, these last few slides have to do with our jigsaw articles. Um, we did talk about EPO. We did talk about altitude training when we um, talked about red blood cells and erythropoiesis, but we went into it a little bit deeper in our articles, and some people may have been absent for the articles. Fifth hour, they didn't even get to have the articles because they had to go circle bubbles for the ACT. Um, so this one has to do with blood doping. You want to know how it's done and why it's dangerous and why somebody might do it. So how is it done? So there's a couple different ones. One, you might actually extract your blood and freeze it and then re-inject it the day before the event. I feel like it's about two weeks in advance maybe that you take the blood out and you would freeze it. Um, and what this does is it causes an overload of red blood cells because in the meantime, so maybe it's more than two weeks, in the meantime, um, your body will have sensed that it was low in oxygen, it would have released EPO, EPO would have signaled erythropoiesis, and you would have made more cells to, to cover up for those that you lost. Then when you put in the old cells, now you have kind of an extra load of red cells. Knowing that red cells carry oxygen, and knowing that oxygen is needed for cellular respiration, which is our energy making process. Um, if you have more red cells, you have more oxygen and therefore you can make more energy. So one would assume you can go faster and longer at that level. A second way of blood doping is actually injecting EPO into your um, body. So this causes red blood cell formation because that's what EPO does. Um, and it would be bad because with all these extra cells, your, your blood becomes more viscous. There's that word again, meaning it's thicker. So with thicker blood, it could cause your, um, your vessels to clog, especially those little capillaries, and it could make, lead to, I think the word is hidden behind the graphic, it could lead to a heart attack. So um, if you want to get a little more details, stop the video for a second and read that graphic, and it'll, it'll tell you a little bit more about it. So altitude training kind of simulates uh, EPO or the blood doping process only in a more natural way. So living up in altitude, <clears throat> the air is less dense. So as you go higher and higher, gas molecules are spread further and further apart. So you can see that here at sea level how close the red cell or the oxygen molecules are. And then if you go up the mountain, they get spread out further and further. So with each breath, you don't get as many oxygen molecules um, delivered to your body. So if you had more red cells, you'll be able to carry more oxygen. So your body senses that it's low in oxygen and it says release EPO and then EPO tells your um, red marrow to make more red blood cells. So then, um, so then you have more red blood cells and you can carry more oxygen. So training at high altitudes gives you that same effect of having an overload of red cells and then the athletes would come down to maybe sea level. Wherever their event is, um, they'll come down to that level in order to compete and then they should have that advantage and that their, um, their blood has become more efficient to, to deal with the lower levels of oxygen. Sorry, the picture isn't covering up that. A lower altitude equals, I don't know. <laughs> 
something about red blood cells, I think, and carrying extra oxygen. Um, so at lower altitudes, you're going to now have more red blood cells than you need, and you'll be able to carry more oxygen is basically what that is referring to, and you can go faster for a longer period of time. And then the graphic over in the bottom right-hand corner, um, that's showing the positive, I'm sorry, the negative feedback loop. So um, the stimulus being low oxygen, the response creation of red cells decreases your stimulus. So that is a negative feedback loop. And finally, our last slide. I hope this has all turned out. Um, so this slide is about the female triad. So there's three parts to the triad and you want to be able to list them. So the first part has to do with uh, body, fat, body fat composition when the body fat drops below 12%. Um, this is usually because of an eating disorder, um, obsessive work ethics, not fulfilling your caloric needs. So um, an athlete who is training at a really high level is burning a lot of calories and then they're not replacing those calories and so that's going to cause a decrease in their their body fat percentage. So basically, the number is 12%. So when the body fat drops below 12%, the body senses that it's not suitable for a pregnancy. And it's not like you're trying to get pregnant every single day, but that's what the survival of the species goal is. So um, so when your body fat drops below 12%, your body says, you're barely healthy enough for yourself. You're definitely not healthy enough for a baby. So it turns the menstrual cycle off. So women or girls in high school, um, they would enter what's called amenorrhea. So A is not or without, and then menses is the menstrual cycle. So um, so when the body fat drops below 12%, a person becomes amenorrheic. And with no longer cycling of the female hormones, um, you're no longer going to release estrogen because that's released during that cycle. Um, estrogen is needed for calcium uptake in bones. And so calcium, remember, is what makes your bones hard. So if you don't have estrogen, you don't take calcium up into your bones, so they become par parotic. They actually have pores in them where calcium would make them more solid. So they become like an old person's bones, brittle. And so osteoporosis sets in. So the body fat drops below 12%, the female stops mensing, and then the Lack of estrogen causes weakening of the bones. And so um, so girls, this is, is not uncommon in high school girls, um, they suffer stress fractures very easily due to this condition.